All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, I uh, got ahead and pressed upon my heart and kind of go a little bit with what our sister shared from the Spirit. Uh, I always pray about, you know, messages to bring, and sometimes I get them and I don't want to bring them, at least on a Sunday morning anyway. But then I can't get nothing else. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we're living in a time when choices have to be made. And I've, I've, I've come to learn this. As I get older uh, in the Lord, there's really only two choices. There's only two choices. In all the different circumstances and situations and the things we're faced with every day, different problems and different things happening in our lives, there's really only two choices. There's Christ, the blood, the cross, the spirit, and then there's Satan and what he offers. Those are the only two choices. Everything that we deal with in our lives every day boil down to those two, two choices. Sometimes they're very evident. Sometimes it's, it's kind of hazy. But those are the only two choices. In all the world, there's seven billion of us here on this planet, I guess now. The choices are still the same. And I'm compelled to preach the gospel of Christ that presents us with a choice, a decision that we each have to make. Now, I've said this before, and it's so good to see you all here this morning. There might be some here that know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You've put your faith and trust in his blood and his shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins, and you're born again and saved. And there's some here that maybe have never done that. Maybe they've never heard that, or maybe they've resisted that for one reason or another. Here's the thing. Satan, and I don't want to give him glory, but that's what we need to understand. He, his goal is to keep you from knowing Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ, he's going to do everything he can to distract you, to discourage you, to keep you away from hearing the gospel. Whatever he can do to get you sidetracked, that's what he'll do. And if you do know Christ, if you are born again and saved, he's going to do everything he can to nullify your witness. He's going to do everything, every distraction, every uh, uh, disturbance, whatever things happen over here, and you get your head turned, and you get your eyes off of Christ. Whatever he can do to be, that's why we call it the spirit of antichrist. Because it's against Christ. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which I was one, saved by grace. That's his purpose. He came to restore the relationship between the Father and his creation that was destroyed because of sin. He came to save sinners. Satan, the spirit of Antichrist, operates to disrupt all that. And anything he can do. Now, now there are three realms that I believe in society. And I'm not a, social, uh, you know, a sociology person. I, I never studied that. But this is just my observation. If somebody knows better than me, you're going to correct me, you can correct me. That's all right. But in society, in culture, in civilization, there are like three realms. There's political. There's the economic realm. And then there's religion. Every place you go on the face of the earth, it could be some tribe in the middle of some jungle somewhere that nobody ever saw, or in the middle of New York City. You have some kind of government, you have some kind of economy, and you have some kind of religion. And when I talk about religion, I include any belief system, even atheism. Well, atheism isn't religion. Yes, it is. It's a belief system. It's a belief that there's no God. It's a belief system. And it's a, it's, it has tenets and everything to it. So all, everything we deal with, whether it's in our New Kensington or Arnold, Pennsylvania, or Moscow, or London, or China, or wherever it is, there's government, there's money, there's religion. And Satan moves in these areas. And he's moving in these areas. Now, a couple weeks ago, we had a, I gave a message dealing with the coming of, the second coming of Christ, and the coming of the Antichrist, and we talked about the rapture and everything. 
This morning, I want to take it a little step further. Because I'll say this again, I said it then and I'll say it now, that this, this earth is looking more and more and more like the Bible says it's going to look before Jesus comes. I'm not telling you what time he's coming because I don't know. If you ask me, he could come like two minutes from now. He can interrupt my message and that would be just fine. But he's returning. And he's coming back for a people who have chosen to follow Christ. Now see, we've, we've produced, uh, in the United States of America, we've produced a whole segment of people who at one time or another went to church and put their hand up and said a prayer and said, oh yeah, okay, I'm saved now, yeah, because I said this prayer. But, but there's never been any change. They've never had a desire. They, a lot of folks have come to Christ because he can fix their problems, but they're not concerned. When, when John the Baptist came before Jesus, when Jesus came, when the apostles went out, you know what they preached? They preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message of the gospel. Repent. Believe. Be saved. We think we can fix ourselves up. You know, a lot of folks, and this is like religion, I can fix myself up, I'll go to church and try to get myself fixed up. I can't fix you up. I couldn't, I couldn't fix myself up. This church can't fix anybody up. There's no church on the face of this earth that, that can fix you. The only way you can get fixed is through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, you got to come, you can't fix yourself up before you get to Christ. You've got to come to Christ and he'll fix you up. That's the gospel. Now, I want you to see something with me this morning. Because we all hear the news. You know, we hear about politics. And we hear about the economy. And, you know, uh, like every nation has gone bankrupt. So I can never quite figure that out. If they're, what, you know, if they're printing money, <laughs> what's it based on? You know, I mean, this, this, anyway, everybody's gone bankrupt. The United States of America, you know, trillion dollars in debt. It would be nice if my bank would let me write him a letter and say, hey, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to, like, extend my terms with you. My bank doesn't let me do that, does it? I wish they could, but they don't. Okay. Turn with me, and this is, now, now a lot of people, when I say this, some people are going to go, ooh, okay. Turn with me to the Revelation. The very last book of the Bible. Now, I always say this whenever I talk about Revelation. It is not Revelations. My brother Lou made, reminded me of that. <laughs> okay. he, he was listening to a tape. It's the revelation. It's an unveiling of God's plan. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a future event represented in the revelation. And a lot of people think revelation is really hard to understand. It's not hard to understand. You get the right outline, it's really pretty simple. It really is. There's some symbolism, and people say, oh, there's all these symbols in Revelation. They try to figure out what it means. All you've got to do is look in the Old Testament. You'll find out what they mean. The symbols in Revelation come from the Old Testament. Because essentially, Revelation, if you read Revelation, then you've got to go read Daniel, because they kind of go hand in hand in the Old Testament. Okay, But that's a whole big thing. I want you to turn with me to chapter 13 of the Revelation. The Revelation was given to the Apostle John, who was in prison. He was on the Isle of Patmos. And he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. The Revelation is the only book in the Bible that carries with it a blessing for reading and understanding. Some people stay away from it. I've actually heard preachers say, well, I'm not going to preach that because nobody understands it. The, the Bible says you're blessed. If you read and understand the Revelation, you're blessed. It's the only book that carries that with it. We can't cover the whole revelation, but I want to I do this chapter 13 because it's so germane to things that are happening in the world today. It means so much of what's going on today because you see what's happening and people scratch their heads and they start to worry. Really, it's just, it's just going the way God says it's going to go. Now just to re recap a little bit what we talked about a few weeks ago, and if you want to get the, the CD, see John, he'll give you the CD. We believe... And this is what I believe. And if you don't want to believe it with me, that's okay. But this is what I believe, and this is what I believe the Bible teaches, is that there's going to come a time when Jesus is going to return and catch up his saints. 
The, the resurrection, the righteous dead are going to rise, and if we're alive at that time and we're born again, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. They call that the rapture of the church. How many people have heard of the rapture of the church? It seems to me there's lots of churches that ain't preaching that no more. But I'm preaching it because it's in the Word. There's a rapture of the church. And after the church is raptured, sometime after that rapture, a man is going to arise who's going to be the, the embodiment of every evil leader that ever lived on the face of this planet. Hitler, Stalin, I mean, you just, you know, Mao, you just list, line them up. They're going to be nothing compared to who this guy's going to be. He's going to be like all of them wrapped up. He's going to be Satan's Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. As Jesus was anointed of the Father, Jesus the Christ, this Antichrist is going to be Satan's Christ. Satan is going to anoint him to do his bidding on this earth. The church is going to be removed. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. When the church is taken up, the, 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 the agency of the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ is removed. The body of Christ is what is restraining evil on this planet even right now. You might say we're not doing a very good job of it. Well, just, just imagine what it's going to be like when the church is out of here. Okay, now. This man of sin, son of perdition, there's a lot of different names in the word for this man we call the Antichrist. He is going to establish leadership on this earth. He is going to uh, have all the answers to all the earth's problems. He's going to bring peace. He's going to have all the answers to the Middle East problem and everything else. And in Daniel, Daniel says that he will make a, a, a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. And those seven years we call the tribulation period or the uh, Jacob's trouble. There's different names for that. But during those seven years, halfway through those seven years, uh, he's going to allow Israel to rebuild their temple. And halfway through those seven years, he's going to enter the temple and set himself up as God. We read about that in 2 Thessalonians a couple weeks ago. Chapter 13 of the Revelation is needs to be understood in that context. So I hope you all understand this is history in, in advance. This is things that, that are going to happen. It's during that seven years that God's going to pour out his wrath on this planet. I don't want to be here when God pours out his wrath. Okay? That's going to happen. Now, look at chapter 13. Just to kind of set up the scenario so everybody understands what's going on. Okay? I hope you understand what's going on. Anyway, okay. Chapter 13. The Apostle John writes, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now what John is seeing in this vision, he's seeing a depiction of a beast coming up out of the ocean. It has seven heads and ten horns. Heads and horns, in this context, talks about authority, governmental authority. This is, this is a governmental power that he's seeing represented. And he goes on and he describes this beast. He says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, this beast, he mentions a leopard and a bear and a lion. Now, if you want to know well, what, what do those represent, you have to go back to Daniel's prophecy. Because in Daniel's prophecy, he saw visions about world kingdoms. And there are four world kingdoms represented in Daniel's prophecy. Okay? One was Babylon. The next is the Medo-Persian Empire. And these are historic kingdoms. You can read about them in history. The, the Medes and the Persians. The third was Greece. And the fourth was Rome. Now, somebody might say, well, you know, there were other kingdoms on the earth. There were Oriental kingdoms. There were kingdoms in North America, the Incas and Aztecs and so forth. But we're only concerned with kingdoms that have something to do with the nation of Israel. Okay? These four kingdoms all had something to do with the nation of Israel. And these four kingdoms represented world power concerning Israel. Okay? Now, he saw this vision. Daniel saw four separate beasts, but John saw one beast altogether. Okay? He had authority. He had power. 
He says in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon. There we have the religious element of this end time system. We have the authority, the power, the governmental authority, which includes military might. Now we have worship. They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Who was the dragon that gave power to the beast? None other than that old dragon, that old serpent. Okay, Satan. They worship the beast. Satan worshipers. Do you know if you don't worship Christ, you worship Satan? People say, I don't even believe in Satan. If you don't worship Christ, because there's only two choices. There's no, like, you know, there's like no independent. It's like Democrat and Republican and independence. It, it doesn't go that way. It's either Christ or Satan. And I'm not comparing Democrats and Republicans to Christ and Satan. But I'm saying there's no in-between. You can deny there's a Satan. You can deny there's a God. Whatever. You're worshiping Satan because that's his program. Jesus has his program. Satan has his. They worship. This is, this is what's going to happen in that time. And this is what's happening today. This is, where, this is where people and, and nations, they begin to think that the government is their God. The government's going to provide everything I need. The government's going to take care of my health. The government's going to... Listen, we need to forget depending on the government because the government can't even balance its own books. If, if I'm going to worry about my health care, you know, I got health care from where I work for 33 years. And I retired. And some of you, I've said this before, some of you know this. I retired from there. And I had, I had free health care for about two years, and then they decided, well, <laughs> there's probably going to come a time they're going to try to take that off of me. I don't care because I'm not depending upon where I used to work for my health care. I've got to depend on the Lord. While it's there, I thank God for it, but once it goes, I just have to, I have to depend on him. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? And who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years, if you want to figure that out. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. This beast hates God. Hates the God of the Bible. You can say God, but don't say Jesus. We live in a nation... Where they say God and God we trust and put one nation under God, 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 God. But they don't say anything about Jesus because then they're having religion. They can't have religion. I, I've, I've, I've heard all the stuff about the founding of our nation. I'm probably going to get in trouble if I keep going down this road. Because somebody, somebody's going to get mad at me. But listen, the people that founded our nation, they might have been good people. They might have even believed in some kind of God somewhere. But when I read them documents like the Declaration of Independence, and you read the Constitution, I don't see Jesus anywhere in them. I see, I see principles, enlightenment principles. You know, the enlightenment, you know, like the French Revolution. I see them kind of principles, but I don't see Jesus anywhere in there. Okay? Listen, all right. And there was given unto him... Verse 5, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. My goodness, it, w w you can't turn the TV on without hearing somebody say something blasphemous about God. Make a mockery out of faith. People in public office making a mockery out of some folks' faith in Jesus Christ. They want to make it look like if you have faith in Christ or you believe what this word says, they want to make you look like you're an idiot. And they do, they, they do a good job of it. And sometimes we help them. <laughs> That's sad to say. That's... And it was given unto him, verse 7, to make war with the saints. When he's talking about saints, you know who he's talking about? He's not talking, well, he's not talking about us because we're gone. <laughs> okay. He's talking about, when Daniel talked about the saints, who was he talking about? He was talking about the nation of Israel, the chosen ones. This battle, he, this, all this is revolving around the nation, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. It's amazing to me that over there on the end of the Mediterranean Ocean, there's this little strip of land that's causing all the problems. 
These people, they've tried to torture them out of existence, put them in ghettos, put them in prison camps, gas them, uh, lie about them, blame everything, every ill in the world on them, and they're still there, and they're still in the middle, in the center of all the stuff that's going on in the earth. Let's me know. I preached a message one time, why Satan hates Israel. He hates them. And we read about it right here. He's going to make war. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of the life of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, I'm saying all this to say, I don't want to, a lot of times people get into the prophetic stuff and people get confused. Here's the bottom line. You better know you're saved. The Lord spoke it this morning. You better know you're saved because things aren't getting better. You can read all the books you want, 10 steps to this and 8 steps to that and 40 days of this. It doesn't matter. This world is crumbling. Our economy, our governments, everything, they're crumbling around the edges. I'm not making that up. You can read it in the newspaper. There was a time when folks would preach like that, when America, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if, if in the 50s somebody would have stood up and said, well, there's going to come a time when you're not going to be allowed to pray in school, they would have laughed them out the pulpit. But it took one woman with, 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 a, with a, a vengeance toward, toward the United States and toward God to pull that down. One woman and a lawyer willing to go to, to court. See, so we take things for granted. But it's wearing away at the edges. This is why we're compelled to say, look, you better know who your faith is in. You can't play that game. You can't just... He says, verse 9. No, no, no let's go back to verse 8. Whose names are written, are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life this morning? Most important question you can ask yourself. Is your name written down in the Lamb's book of life? If it's not, then when this stuff happens, I mean, it's bad enough that things happen in life. Every one of us in here, I know most of you all, and every one of you in here are going through some kind of, some kind of challenge in your life. But just imagine facing the wrath of God. Just imagine standing in front of that great white throne and hearing him say, depart from me, I don't know you. Your name needs to be written in the Lamb's book of life. And see, there's a lot of people in here whose your names aren't written there. You might say, I, I, what do I need, need to hear this for? I've heard, I know I'm saved. Huh? But see, if you are, you need to tell somebody else. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now listen to what he says. Verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay, verse 11. And I beheld another beast. Now, now he sees another beast. The first beast came out of the sea. He says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke as a dragon. I believe, and, and you can get some different opinions on this, I believe the first beast represents the system. The second beast represents the man. The system, the world system, the world order, politics, government, economy, religion, the world order, I believe the second beast is the man. Some might have different opinion. It's okay, but that's what... I believe. He says. He says he had two horns like a lamb. He looked so peaceful. He looked so, he looked so inviting. Just a, just a wonderful leader who everybody loves. And he's so, he's so loving and caring. But he has a mouth like the dragon. You ever know anybody like that? <laughs> you ever know anybody like that? They call him, they call him a, 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 a lamb in wolf's clothing, or a wolf in lamb's clothing. I'm not sure exactly. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh -huh. There's a few of them around. Okay, we won't go there either. He said, listen. Verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. He has all the authority of this world system. 
All the economy, all the religion, all the, all the governmental power of the world is in his hands. And he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to what? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He calls all the earth to worship this system. I mentioned this once before. If you have, if you have the, the documentary channel on your TV set, we have it on the, on the uh, dish, documentary channel, there's a program on there about people who escaped from North Korea. You know about North Korea? In North Korea, Kim Jong-il was considered a god. All the people were starving there. But they, they lifted him up as a god. In, in communist Russia and communist China, the government is God. It says that he caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He does miracles. Points a finger and poof. And people were impressed. Boy, if somebody does a trick like that, you say, wow, maybe there's something to this guy. You've got to watch out for signs of wonder. I believe in signs and wonders. I believe God moves. I believe God can do anything he wants to do. But you better make sure your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He says this. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast uh, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto that image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. We haven't faced that to any great extent. But it's really the same thing that used to go on in the Roman Empire when we read about the early Christians being you know, fed to the lions and so forth. They weren't killed because they were Christians. They weren't killed because they worshipped Jesus Christ. They were put to death because they refused to worship the emperor. See, you can have any religion you want to as long as you bow down to the guy pulling the strings. If you bow down to the one who's in charge, then yeah, go ahead, call yourself a Christian, whatever. As long as you bow down to the guy in charge. It's the nation we're living in right now. We're going in that direction. Yeah, you know, have a church, you know, keep it to yourself. As long as you, as long as you bend your knee to the folks who are running the place. That's what, all this, that's what all this government stuff, you know, the entitlement program, all this government money, they want you to bow your knee to them. They want you to worship them because they're feeding you. Because they're giving you the cash. They're providing this, they're providing that. So you bow down to them. He says. He says in verse 14. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, and so forth. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16. And he causes all. Now here we go. We talk about power. We talk about religion. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Well, there's been a lot of folks who try to figure out what this, what this number is, and, and how this is going to happen. And in, in John's day, he, you know, he didn't have a clue. But we know today, we live in a society that's becoming a cashless society. You do so much with debit card, electronic. And it's just a matter of time before, if they're doing it now, you can plant a little chip in your finger, or whatever, just a little microchip, it contains everything about you from the time you were born until now. How much money you got in the bank, how much you make per year, everything, everything. Can, they can record that, and they can track you with GPS. And they're marketing this thing for children. Well, if you put this in your kid, somebody kidnaps them, you can find out where they are. They're marketing this thing for, you know, in case somebody steals your credit card. We're living in that time. We're living in that time. The world is looking more and more like it's going to look before the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the question. I've said all that to say, and, and again, when you get into, like, Revelation chapter 13, it gets, you know, all these symbols and everything, and people get confused. Listen, here's the bottom line. Are you ready for what's coming on this earth? Are you ready for economic downturn? 
You ain't seen nothing. Like what's happening. They're, they're staving it off. They're printing more money. They're, they're giving bailouts here and bailouts there. Eventually somebody's going to run out of something. So that sounds like bad news. Well, if you don't know the Lord, is bad news. But are you ready? Are you ready for what's happening in our government? In this nation? In Europe? In South America? In Africa? In Asia? Are you ready for, the, for, the, for, these, for these alignment of nations as God said it would happen? Are you ready? I said all this to say this, and, and you might forget about the beast, and you might forget about all this stuff. Just remember this stuff. You better, be, you better have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because I want to tell you something. If you were to die today, before all this stuff happens, you say, well, man, I'll miss all that, I'll die. If your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're going to end up in a lake of fire. I said this before. And I say it again, and it's something I repeat over and over and over, and people probably get sick of hearing me saying it. But it's this. Everybody lives forever somewhere in a body. You're, gonna, you're always going to be you. You're never going to be somebody different. You're, you know, some people teach and believe that if you die, you come back as somebody else. Forget that. You will always be you. When you were formed in your mother's womb, an individual, a unique individual was formed, you will always be who you are. And there's nobody like you anywhere in time or eternity. You'll always be you. You'll always have your name, your personality. God knew your name before you were born. And you're going to spend forever somewhere. You're going to have a body either in the presence of God or in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible teaches. You can say you don't believe it. Don't believe it. That's what this word teaches. And that's what I'm compelled to preach. You know, my concern is, um, I'd love to preach, you know, I mean, there are people, folks preaching, you know, how to have a better sex life. I'm, I'm not preaching that stuff. I'm, I want to see, I don't want to see people go to hell. I remember before I got saved, people would come to me and talk to me about Jesus. How many remember? Some of you were saved at a very young age. Thank God. I was saved when I was 30. I can't tell you how many people would come to me and talk to me about Jesus. I said, no, thank you. No, thanks. Uh, and and, and I, I would, maybe some of you have heard things like this. I would say stuff like, well, I worship, I worship God my own way. I worship God my own way. Anybody ever say that? Anybody ever hear that? Yeah, I worship God my own way. I read the Bible. You ever tell anybody that? I remember, I remember before I would say, people would come up and say, let me show you something in the Bible. I said, I read, I read that Bible. I haven't read the Bible. <laughs> I read the Bible. I know the Lord's Prayer. I read the Bible. We have all these, you know, oh yeah, I got, I got my own. Oh, me and God, well, I got my own. It's either Christ or Satan. Jesus says the Father is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about the kind of music you use. It's not about, you know, whether it's long or short, or whether it's lively or kind of laid back. It's not about any of that. It's about, have you been born again? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If it is, then you have a hope that whether you, whether you live or die, the Apostle Paul said, to live as Christ, to die as gain. It's a win-win it's a situation. If your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then there's no hope. You might even do well in this life. You might get a good job. You might make lots of money. You might have a big house. You might have a good car. You might have respect and prestige. But when the time comes when your name gets called, you're going to stand before a righteous God. And he's going to say, open the books up. See if your name's written. In the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name isn't there, then to say, depart from me. See, my heart and my hope is nobody that, hear, that comes and hears the word preached in this church, whether by me or somebody else, will be able to leave this room and say, I don't understand that Christian stuff. I want you to understand it. I want you to know what's happening. 
I don't want you to go and read what's going on in the newspaper and say, boy, I wonder what this is all about. It's, it's God's timing. It's God's plan. It's, it's his time clock. Everything is going just the way he said it would. Don't wring your hands and say, oh, what's going to happen to the economy? It, he, he tells us what's going to happen. The question that you have to ask yourself, are you ready? Are you ready? Is your name, is your name, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The only one I'm sure about is mine. And I'm not saying that because I'm such a good person, because I'm a preacher, because I remember the time I got on my knees and I repented of my sins and I said, God, forgive me and make me a new creature. I remember, I can, I can remember where I was. I don't remember the date, because I'm not good with dates. But I can remember where I was. And from that point on, before I ever, decided, you know, I ever felt called to the ministry, or before I ever said another prayer, before I ever I was baptized, uh, my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life because my faith and trust was in the blood of Jesus Christ. And from that point on, he took me and he started changing me. He's still changing me. And he's still working on me because there are a few things I've been a little stubborn about. But he's, he's still working on me. But the thing is, I'm not going to heaven because I've been good or because I've changed this or done that. I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ shed his blood for me. And when I went to that cross, it wasn't a one-shot deal that I'd go to the cross and get saved and that's it. But well, I stay there, and the blood of Jesus saved me, and now he's changing me. I can't get changed any other way. I try all them other ways. They don't work. It's only Christ that brought a change to my life, that made me ready for this stuff we're reading. If you don't remember one thing about Revelation chapter 3, remember this much. Someday... They're going to look for your name in a book. And if it's not written, he's going to say, depart from me. What chilling words. You know what the Bible says? And we all know it if you've read the word. The Bible says there's going to be preachers there. There's going to be, there's going to be folks that said we, we preach the word and cast out devils. They're going to hear those words. They're going to depart from me. But Lord, didn't we? Didn't you know? Leave. Go. Forever. For eternity. Eternity is a long time with no hope. Our hope right now is Jesus Christ. You better buckle your seatbelts for what's going on in this world and make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's our only hope. That's your only hope. That's it. You know, I don't know what else to preach. I don't know what else... I, you know, I said, Lord, give me a message. He keeps I, I, I want to get, give me a different message. I, I, don't wanna, I don't know what else to preach than Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't know what else to preach than to say, be sure your name is written. And if you know your name is written, I know you know somebody whose name isn't. So if you know your name is written, then it's up to all of us to go and tell somebody else. To go and tell them, listen, this is what's happening. People will come to you. And, and, and something else I'm going to tell and, and this is, I'm going to close with this. I promise. I think, I think I'm going to close. If you spend your time with Christ at the cross, listen, nobody's going to have to teach you how to witness. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more time you spend in his word, nobody, you don't have to take a course on evangelism. Because if you get so full of the Holy Spirit, it won't, you won't be able to keep it in. If you're born again and saved, and you're, and you're seek, uh, eating and drinking and living this word, just like was spoken, if, if, you're, if you're immersing yourself in God's word, you don't, you're not going to have to take a course on door-to-door -door evangelism. Because everywhere you go, people will look at you and they'll see, they'll sense the presence of God. They'll sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, he said unto you and your children and your children's children, this baptism of the Holy Ghost, this infilling of the Holy Spirit, if you spend time with God, you'll be filled to overflowing. You won't have to wear, you won't have to wear a t-shirt which says Jesus on it. You won't have to, you know, carry around, you know, put the bumper sticker on. They'll be able to know. They'll be able to know. I want to ask you this morning. I want to ask you this morning. Between you and God, is your name written in the Lamb's 
book of life? Are you born again and saved? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? The most important question you ever ask yourself. And the answer really isn't important to me. I'm just bringing the message. This is the answer between you and your God. I'd like to ask you to stand with me if you could. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I hope and pray I've been obedient to share your word this morning as you've told me to share it. I hope and pray that some ear has heard this morning. Father, if there are believers in this room that have been distracted, have been had their head turned, that, that they have not been obedient, they have not listened, they have not spent time, God, I pray that some words this morning would be have convicted them. That there would be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Not a guilt trip, not just because of something I said, but because your word says. And Father, if there's somebody in this place this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, they, if, if, if you ask them, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they shrug their shoulders and they say, I don't know about any Book of Life. Well, they know about it now. Lord, I pray that there wouldn't be one person in this room that would not understand what salvation is about. And I pray, Lord, that everybody in this room, Father, as you have broken up some fallow ground, I pray, God, that the seeds that have been planted this morning, will begin to take root and bear fruit. And Father, everybody in this room will be able to say, yes, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Yes, I don't, I, I don't, I, it doesn't matter what goes on in the world. It doesn't matter what happens to the dollar. It doesn't matter whether Greece or Italy goes bankrupt. It doesn't matter what they do in Iraq or Iran or Pakistan or Afghanistan. All that matters is my name is written in the Lamb's book of life and whatever happens, I know that I have a hope of eternity. Father, I pray that everybody in this room will grab a hold of that truth and will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because it says in your word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. That's where we find everlasting life.